Um, you're very welcome to the uh, Smithfield and Stony Batter People's History Project. This is the first session um, since our uh, hugely successful um, um, Church Street disaster commemoration uh, event. And we want to thank everyone who contributed or attended or participated in any way. Uh, and I just want to let you know that there are uh, pamphlets, the commem commemoration pamphlets still avail available for the reasonable price of four euro. And she can get back, back there with Mary. Um, for today's session, we are returning to the subject of institutions in the Smithfield and Stony Batter area. Um, our speaker is Dr. Blonde Nolan. And Blonde has a BA in Communication Studies from DCU and a Master's in Women's Studies from UCD. She has just submitted her, PH, her PhD thesis in Women's Studies, which is entitled Power, Punishment, and Penance An Archival Analysis of the Transportation of Irish Women from Grange Gorman to Dublin. Uh, in Dublin to Hobart Town in Van Diemen's Land, 1844 to 1853. During her studies, Blonnet was an IRCHSS Government of Ireland Scholar. In 2010, she was awarded the Lord Edward Fitzgerald Memorial Fund Travel Grant and traveled to Tasmania to do research. Uh, in 2011, she was awarded the McCurtain Collin Women's History Essay Prize for her essay of some of the women that we're going to hear about today. Uh, Blonnet is going to talk to us about the transportation of Irish women to Van Diemen's Land. These women had been held in the women's uh, depot in Grange Gorman prior to transportation during the mid 19th century and up to the ending of transportation in 1853. Uh, there will be a question and answer period following Blonnet's talk. Uh, so without further ado, please give a warm welcome to Blonnet Nolan. Hi, ladies and gentlemen. Um, sorry for the delay. I hope, uh, I hope you think it's worth it. Um, so as uh, Julianne said, my name is, um, is Blonnet and I did just, when I say recently submit my PhD thesis, it was Friday last week, so it's <laughs> very, very recent and I was surprised that she called me Dr. Blonnet, no, no, I need to get used to that. Anyway, so I'd like to start by giving kind of a, an overview of transportation with some figures and uh, years, but not too many. Um, and then I think, I think you'd like to hear about the establishment of the Richmond Penitentiary and how it became the Richmond or Grange Gorman female penitentiary and transportation depot. Um, I'll talk a little bit about uh, what the women did in the transportation depot, um, how they were treated, what they were fed. Um, and I'll give a short account of the female convict management system in place once the women disembarked. However, I find with these kind of talks, uh, what people really want to know is more about the personal story, the individual women. And, and there are a number uh, of women that I'd like to tell you about. Um, the type of crime they committed, their petitions, and most importantly, what happened to them uh, in their new colonial home. So, some facts and figures. Um, altogether, 162,119 men and women were transported to Australia from its establishment as a colony in 1787 right up to the last convict ship that docked in Western Australia in 1868. There were 24,658 women transported to Australia between its foundation and 1853. And of those, over 8,600 8, were Irish, so more than a third were Irish. All Irish women transported after 1836, spent time in Grange Gorman, which was significant, significantly the first female penitentiary in the British Isles. From 1844 until the end of transportation to Van Diemen's Land in 1853, over 3,000 women were transported on 16 ships from Grange Gorman to Hobart in Van Diemen's Land, which is now Tasmania. 
Convict voices are elusive to historians, and the majority of the convict narratives extant are by male convicts. My research uniquely draws on archival material both here in Ireland and in Tasmania, affording the opportunity for the first time to hear something of a female convict's voice on both sides of the transportation experience, providing, so to speak, a transnational story of transportation. This is an example of the Grange Gorman uh, Transportation Register, and altogether there are 21 um, columns. Um, I'm sure it's very difficult to see, but just the third column in, for example, um, would be their names, and beside that would be their crime. And on the right-hand side, that's a description of whether they are married or single, what religion they are, um, their physical description, their height, eye, eye colour, hair colour, whether they've been convicted before, um, and um, what occupation they had. And Specifically, the very end column um, is the ship, but the heading on that is disposed of, which really kind of started me into this when I noticed it first because it irked me, um, because what do we dispose of? Like rubbish. So these were women really just sent off to the other side of the world. And this is an example of uh, a conduct page for um, one woman in the conduct register in Van Diemen's Land. So the details of the women on each ship were recorded in a new type of register in separate individual ledgers and each page was allocated to an individual woman, such as this. The case studies of the women provide the qualitative aspect of this research. So by following these individual case histories through the archival records of Van Diemen's Land, it's evident that the women did not comprise a homogenous group. Historical sources are particularly limited in relation to the lives of ordinary peasant class or working class women. So by utilising archives in both countries, this research provides information about and gives a voice to a cohort of Irish women who have thus far been largely ignored or under-researched by mainstream history. Grange Gorman in Dublin, to the north of the Lifty, between Smithfield, Stony Batter and the North Circular Road, became a district of numerous institutions. The construction of her carceral buildings to house the poor had many characteristics in common. Dublin housed its walls, housed its unwanted and undesirables in spaces that lent themselves to observation, exercise, labour behind high walls. Land was cheaper in the area known as Grange Gorman and has been described thus. One of the most extraordinary juxtapositions in the city or anywhere was the three monsters of iniquity in North Brunswick Street, the Richmond Lunatic Asylum, the Richmond Female Penitentiary, and the North Dublin Union, set back to back without a single acknowledgement to one another. And this would be a, a map of the North Dublin Union in 1836, and we can see the Richmond Penitentiary, Female Penitentiary, up in the um, top kind of left corner. The houses of industry are in the, the centre. And then more detailed in 1849, we can see the Richmond Penitentiary up in the top right corner, the Richmond Lunatic Asylum, and uh, the houses of industry. The North Dublin Union's House of Industry was a catalyst to the institutional development of the area, and various hospitals were built in the early 19th century to care for its inmates and for those of the neighbouring Richmond Penitentiary. A network of buildings consequently quickly developed around the workhouse, and they were an asylum for aged and infirm poor, an asylum for incurable lunatics, the Bedford Asylum for reception of children, the Hardwick Fever Hospital, the Whitcourt Hospital for chronic medical patients, the Richmond Surgical Hospital, and the Talbot Dispensary supplying medical and surgical care for over 300 poor in the northwest of the city on a weekly basis. The North Dublin Union, with its houses of industry, lunatic asylum, penitentiary and hospitals, could hold up to 2,000 inmates. It was entrusted to a group of men, the, it was entrusted to a group of men to build a new penitentiary in the area of Grange Gorman. Francis Johnston, a celebrated architect of the time, was hired to design both the Richmond Lunatic Asylum and Richmond Penitentiary. 
Some of Francis Johnston's best known works would be the G GPO and uh, Nelson's Pillar on then Sackville Street, now O'Connell Street. Johnston began construction of the penitentiary in 1813. The front part of the building consisted of a centrepiece, atop of which an impressive clower, a clock tower rested, a clock face looking in all four directions. On either side of the centrepiece were two wings pierced by massive gateways. The year 1816 is on the weather vane on the cupola, and historian Thomas King Moylan says it can be assumed that this was the year the building was complete. Whereas, historian Henry Heaney states definitively it was finished in 1818 and served as an emergency fever hospital. Although, although the records get confusing here, there was a national fever epidem epidemic in Ireland from 1817 to 1819. And it would seem that the Richmond Penitentiary did not actually serve as a penitentiary when it was first opened, but a fever hospital. The establishment of the Grange Gorman Female Penitentiary provided a model for the rest of the British Isles. The 1837 report of the Inspectors Generals of Prisons in Ireland is a virtual explosion of excitement and self-congratulatory discourse sprinkled with a generous helping of sex stereotyping. Grange Gorman was seen by the inspectors as a shining example to female prisons all over the country. The discipline of female prisons throughout the country is likely to receive a stimulus for the example of the Grange Gormel female penitentiary recently opened in Dublin, they say. It had been long an opinion formed by us and supported by Mrs. Fry and the benevolent ladies who have been associated with her in visiting jails in England that it was desirable, as far as circumstances might permit, to establish prisons wholly confined to the reception of females under female officers and distinct from any place of confinement for males. The female character is particularly open to good or evil influence. No class of criminals are so e easily corrupted and further demoralized by ill-regulated intercourse. Nor is there, on the other hand, any class on whom more moral government and instruction produce so rapid or so favorable a change. So they say. The English Quaker and philanthropist Elizabeth Fry enjoyed a famed reputation and extraordinary public status in England, rivaled only by Queen Victoria. She was a most prominent woman in British public life and a legendary figure. Having campaigned for better conditions for female transportees on board ships and already introduced major reforms in the female section of London's Newgate Prison, during her visit to Ireland in 1823, she is said to have greatly influenced the Chief Secretary with her proposal for an exclusively female institution staffed by female officers. The Act of 1836 saw Grange Gorman performing a dual function and came into effect the following year. One was a national transportation holding depot to be paid for by the government department of the, the convict department of the government. The other was a female prison for the city of Dublin for which the grand jury paid the cross. The prison was now to receive, and I quote, all females under sentence of, un of transportation in transitu from their respective counties to the convict ships. Marion Rawlins, with the approval of government, was personally chosen by Elizabeth Fry to be head matron. Her previous experience was in the female wing of the penitentiary in cold bath fields in Middlesex. The position of head matron involved the threefold responsibility of being governess, teacher of works, and schoolmistress. Under Rollins was a deputy matron and 23 female officers who were selected, the inspectors assured, after a grueling interview process. Rollins, as head matron, was, however, wholly responsible for the internal government of the penitentiary. The main function of Grange Gorman was to provide the prisoners with moral instruction and employment and the inspectors gave assurances to this report that the women had been amply supplied since the opening of the institution. Reformation through labour was espoused by the inspectors but this also had an economical dimension. The women were engaged in needlework contracted by the Admiralty 
and were kept occupied by sewing, knitting, cleaning, cooking, working in the hospital attending lunatics or the reception ward, or working in the laundry, which carried out the institution's day-to-day -day maintenance. Some of the prisoners also acted as wardswomen. This training, along with schooling, was provided in Grange Gorman so that the convict women would make fit domestic or farm servants in Van Diemen's Land. Through their work, the female prisoners were in, fa in fact paying for their own diet. For breakfast, they received three and a half ounces of oatmeal, three and a half ounces of Indian meal stirabout, and one pint of new milk. And for dinner, one pound, one pound of brown bread and one pint of buttermilk. The prison diet lacked meat and vegetables and undoubtedly contributed to high incidence of diarrhea and some cases of scurvy on the voyage, which comprised mainly of beef, salted beef and pork and very few vegetables. Historian Anne McMahon has written that from the convict vessel the Arabian, which embarked in 1846, matrons were appointed for Irish female transport vessels. On later vessels, two matrons were placed on some ships. The appointed matrons were to spend two months in Grange Gorman prior to embarkation of the transport vessel. Although ordered to keep a journal to be sent to the government after the voyage, sadly, none of these have survived. Her duties were to attend to the bodily comfort, education, work, and moral improvement of her charges. This table illustrates the names of the seven ships that I focused on in this research, their dates of departures and arrivals, the numbers of women and children on board, and the numbers of deaths suffered during the voyage. The average length of the journey was three months, although the John William Dare, which departed in 1851, had an unusually long voyage of five months. Of the seven ships, or 1,095 women, 34 died. This is a remarkably low death rate if compared with death rates on emigrant ships crossing the Atlantic. And this is where they were going. Van Diemen's Land is pretty much the size of Ireland, it's, it's slightly smaller. And more to the south there's Hobart and more to the north there's Launceston. And they have a kind of a, a similar uh, relationship as Dublin and Cork. Launceston thinks they should be the capital. Um, whereas Hobart is the capital. Uh, the average age of a, a female convict was 27, although this decreased to 25 during the famine years. The majority of women transported in this study were young, single, Roman Catholic, illiterate, and over half had been convicted of just one or two crimes before. The majority were transported for larceny and sentenced to seven years. According to those who argued for the benefits of transportation for the public good, the consequences for convicts who were transported were exile, labour, punishment and reform for convict women. Labour was extracted through assignment and punishment. Labour was extracted through assignment and punishment and reform through the female factories. Assignment of convicts was an official policy adopted by the colonial government and sanctioned by the British government, whereby on arrival convicts were assigned to colonial officials or free settlers as domestic or farm labourers who worked for free in exchange for their keep. Depending on their behaviour, they gained a ticket of leave after a certain amount of time. And a ticket of leave was tantamount to freedom and this allowed convicts to change employers and demand wages. In my case histories, tickets of leaves or some element of freedom have been given after an average of six years. Because of, the immediate, because of the immediate dispersal of convict women into colonial homes, by taking convict children from their mothers and placing them in state orphanages, and by making it difficult for convicts to marry, the colonial government had greatly reduced convicts' ability to marry, have a family, or their own domestic space, and thus making home life ever more deferred, constrained, and fragile for convicts. In the 1820s, a boys' and girls' state orphanage was established just outside Hobart. These establishments served many purposes. Their crucial function 
was to assist in the reassignment of convict mothers to free settlers. These two institutions rarely held orphans, and the majority institutionalized within their walls were children of convict women. There were a myriad of reasons as to why women might be sent to the female factory. Upon arrival in Van Diemen's Land, the, woman, the women were classified into three levels in the factories. Within the female factories, the management of convict women was through order, daily routine, gauged tasks and regulated penalties. At the lower end of the scale of this, at the lower end of the scale was the third or crime class women. This comprised of two types of women. Convict women who had broken a rule of assignment, which was usually very minor, and who were sent to the factory by their master for punishment. The other woman was a woman who became pregnant, was unmarried, and because of her pregnancy, unable to perform her duties. Historian Tony Rayner describes it, th it thus. Perhaps the worst crime committed against women in history has been to degrade those who became pregnant whilst unmarried, or who through poverty asked a living by prostitution, whilst ignoring the most basic fact that procreation requires both a man and a woman. Men did not receive such punishment, nor were they legally obliged to provide financially for their offspring. Following the birth of the woman's child, and after whatever amount of time was deemed allowed by the authorities, these women still had to serve a six-month sentence of hard labour for getting pregnant in the first place. In the third or crime class, from 1826 and in the years that followed, the women's heads could be shaved, a punishment said to be more upsetting to them than any other. Their diet was poorer than the other classes, and they had to wear coarse plain clothes with a large yellow C, sewed on the back of their jackets, sleeves, and shifts of their uniforms. Official records, both here in Ireland and Van Diemen's Land, place the women in a wider context of convicts' narratives and reconstructs in part the lives of convict women through the petition sent to the Lord Lieutenant in, vice, in the Vice Regal Lodge. And the genre of writing utilised in convict petitions were for, formulaic and formal. In some cases, the judgments of the cases were analysed. The following are the personal stories of some of the women transported from Grange Gorman. Mary Byron was transported on board the Waverley for seven years on October the 26th, 1847. She was 46 years old, could read and came from Carlow. Her case study is significant as it sheds light on the desperation Irish working class people were subjected to during the famine. Mary Byron was married and had three children. She was Roman Catholic and was convicted of stealing clothes. She had been convicted four times previous to her transportation. Twice she'd been sentenced to six months for stealing potatoes, served 12 months for stealing a pot, and six months for a pen. This might lend some credence to habitual criminality, but in reality she and her family were destitute and these were, the, these were during the worst years of the famine. Mary Byron was 20 years older than the average age of transported convict women. There's confusion in the records as to how many children went with Mary Byron. According to historian Catherine Fleming, the chief secretary allowed her two youngest, Matthew and Bridget, to travel with her. However, according to Mary Byron's conduct register and convict indent, there was only one child on board the ship with her. Both of these records also state that she said she had four children, although her own petition only mentions three. We can speculate that the other children probably remained in Nace Workhouse. She had travelled from Carlow to Atai, County Kildare, a distance of approximately 15 miles. She was accompanied by her husband Peter and her children. Having had former convictions, she and her husband were again convicted of stealing clothes, a crime of total despair, resulting in little hope of clemency. The couple petitioned on their own behalf, professing that they had three children, one ma male aged 11 years, one male aged 8 years, and one female aged 2 years, all of whom were with them in Athai jail. They point out that the children were destitute of any friends in the neighbourhood, and under the circumstances, 
petitioners most humbly hope that your excellency will be pleased to take their distressing case into your humane consideration and order that the children may be allowed to proceed with them otherwise they will be de left destitute unfortunately no further records could be found for their children in ireland her husband peter was also tra transported for this crime though on the blenheim two years later in 1849 as the transportation of male convicts had been suspended for two years from late 1846 to 1848 because of economic depression in Van Diemen's Land. She, she was recorded in Grand Gorman Transportation Register as having no occupation. But on, upon arrival, Mary Byron's jail report merely recounts her former offences and lengths of sentences and her surgeon's report was one word, quiet. She was recorded as having four children, but only one was on board with her. And her occupation in Van Diemen's Land was recorded as farm servant. Having a clean conduct register was an incentive for mothers to reclaim their children, as their children had been taken from them and put into the government-run orphanages. But having said that, Mary Byron was found with a man in her bedroom. Uh, for which she received six months hard labour and it was recommended that she not be allowed to enter service in Hobart Town and was to be hired to the interior, meaning the rural interior of the colony. This was her only offence in the colony and would have been viewed as grossly immoral conduct defying the strict moral code demanded of the convict system. What is clear from the outset is that many of the offences in Van Diemen's Land consisted of minor infractions such as absent without leave, ne neglect of duty, insubordination, or other trivial, infri trivial infringements like misconduct, and nothing that would have warranted a term of imprisonment in Ireland or Britain. The convict women in this data set who were punished in Van Diemen's Land were mostly punished for social and sexual misbehaviour. It could be hypothesised that female conduct registers reflect the high moral expectations as well as high labour demands that Victorian middle class employers or those who aspired to be perceived as such had of their convicts. Although Mary Byron received her ticket of leave in 1850, it was revoked two years later in September 1852. In May 1852, she was fined five shillings for being drunk and using indecent language. And in August of the same year, her petition to have her family sent out was refused. By February 1853, she was recommended for a conditional pardon, and in November 1853, despite the earlier decree of not being allowed to enter service in Hobart, she gained her certificate of freedom and was, in fact, living in Hobart. Having arrived in the colony in October 1847, she was free after six years and one month, a recurring theme of these case studies. A three-year-old girl named Biddy Byron was admitted to the Queen's Orphanage Newtown on October 29, 1847, but she was discharged to her mother on June 12, 1851. This is a relatively happy ending for Biddy and Mary Byron's story, although Mary Byron had to wait over four and a half years to reclaim her daughter, and the, and the petition to have her other children sent out to her failed. Catherine Colligan, aged 35 from Tipperary, was convicted of the murder of her landlady, Margaret Foran, with whom she lived with her husband and her child in Kildare. She is one of the few Protestants in the case histories, was married and could read and write. Her story is interesting for a number of reasons. Whether Catherine Coll Colligan actually committed the crime she was convicted of is called into question. As was seen often in the case hi histories I researched, Catherine was not an habitual offender. Neither was she in the usual category of young 20-something-year-old who was single. Historian Catherine Fleming stated that on the evening of the 22nd of February, 1847, Mrs. Ferran was assaulted in her cabin with a shovel and left bleeding on the floor by the hearth with a fractured skull. Although she could not speak and tell of her assailant, she lingered for three, for three days before dying. While her file contains no petition, it does contain an intriguing letter detailing the circumstances from the man who found Catherine Colligan guilty. Judge Crampton stated, 
I pronounced sentence of death upon the convict and fixed Wednesday the 25th of April next for the day of execution. He considered the convict, though neither lunatic nor idiot, appeared to be very low in the scale of humanity and to have but very indistinct notions of the difference between right and wrong. He described her as a married woman and that, and I quote, her husband, who was entirely unconnected with the crime of his wife and his being miles away from home at the time when the crime was perpetrating, was the first person to institute inquiry and the first to bring the police to the scene of his wife's guilt. Ignorant, no doubt, he was that it was by his own wife's hand that the bloody deed was done. But he still deserves some consideration for the promptitude with which he stepped forward to appeal the cause of justice. A promptitude not of common occurrence in this country with persons of his class. While Catherine Colligan's voice is absent in the Irish records, her version of events entered into the conduct register in Hobart puts a very different twist on the murder. She stated that her husband had beaten the woman to death but he had had witnesses to state he was somewhere else. If this was the truth, then bringing the police to the murder scene when he had an ironclad alibi would most certainly cast a shadow of suspicion of his, on his wife. Taking this into consideration, then his need to convey the police as quickly as possible to his home could only have been beneficial to him and would frame his wife. If Catherine Colligan was telling the truth, this suggests that her husband wanted to get rid of her, possibly inherited the cabin of Margaret Foran, and with a wife transported, with a wife sentenced to transportation for life, perhaps he had a woman in mind to take Catherine Colligan's place. The judge's bias is blatant, not only when he referred to Mr. Colligan as an exception in this country with persons of his class, but also when he recommended the Lord Lieutenant to spare the life of one who though perhaps unfit to live, is certainly most unfit to die, and to commute the guilty prisoner's sentence to transportation for life. Guilty or not, Catherine Colligan, along with 133 other Irish female convicts and 33 of their children, were embarked on, on board the Waverley in Kingston Harbour, or Dunleary, on the 21st of June, 1847. The significance of Catherine Colligan's story is twofold. She was punished only twice in the colony. Secondly, as with other women convicted of murder in these case histories, she had a much lower rate of recidivism than the petty thieves. She had never been convicted in Ireland and could, she could read and write. In her conduct register, she made the following statement. My husband murdered her, but he brought witnesses to show he was not there. At a time when there is little evidence of the personal experience of this class of women, their first person statements are examples of the convict voice regardless of its brevity. In Grange Gorman she had been recorded as of no occupation. Catherine Colligan's occupation now was a laundress, a plain cook and a dairy woman. Although there is, a more, of, there is more of a multitasking nature to her occupation's description, Higher status occupations would have required a specific, a specific skill, such as needlework. Her first offence was that she delivered an illegitimate baby boy named Joseph in 1849. The second was insolence and refusing to work, earning her six months of hard labour in 1852. It was also noted in her conduct register that she not be allowed to enter any service to the southward of Oaklands. Oaklands is situated in central Van Diemen's land, is north of Hobart and almost halfway between Hobart and Launceston. Instructions such as to be assigned into, to the interior or not to be allowed to enter service in Hobart appear frequently in the conduct registers of these women. There was a husband in Ireland, although possibly if her version of events was to be believed. He was a murderer who lied to the police and orchestrated false witnesses to implicate his wife. But despite this, a license to marry was sought and gained to Patrick Grogan in June 1854. She received her ticket of leave 
the same year, which meant she was relatively free within seven years of her arrival. A few years later, she was granted her conditional pardon in 1857. It should be remembered that Judge Crampton had referred to Colligan as somebody that was not fit to live. This seems to have been particularly harsh, a particularly harsh characterization in that her offences in Van Diemen's land are both very little in quantity and gravity. The next case study is Mary Carroll's petition by her husband, Patrick Carroll. Mary Carroll was 37, married and could read and write. She was from Dublin and was Roman Catholic. Again, her age and marital status do not align with the majority of convict women who were transported. She was convicted in Dublin for a felony of money. Similarities with other petitions emerge. Her husband humbly beseeches the Lord, Lieutenant, Lord Lieutenant's mercy, as his wife is of weak intellect, which could be verified, verified by medical men. And because of this weakness, she was influenced by a more guilty party. Despite the fact that she could read and write, Patrick Carroll alleged that because of her weak intellect, she was made a dupe, the dupe of artful designing villains who have, been, who have been her ruin and cause of her present awful situation. He implored for the Lord Lieutenant's mercy on, behalf, on, on her behalf and for four afflicted children whom a petitioner are reduced to the most agonizing state by her misfortune. The highly respectable signatures are hoped to operate in her favour and prevent her from undergoing a, her awful sentence, a pattern that ab appears throughout the petitions. Patrick Carroll pleaded for his wife's sentence to be carried out in a prison at home. Despite similar recommendations in their letters that accompanied petitions, they, the judges seemed to have the final say in Dublin Castle. Similar to Catherine Colligan's husband's petition on behalf of his wife, the judge proceeded to castigate the prisoner whilst commending the character of her husband. That the prisoner was, as stated in the memorial, convicted before the Right Honourable Justice on the 27th of May last of having stolen money from the shop of Terence Brown. That it appeared she had done so in a very artful and cunning way that she had been five times before tried and twice before convicted of felonies of a similar character. I believe her husband, the memorialist, to be a respectable man, but I am regretfully of the opinion that under the circumstances, the prisoner is not a deserving object of mercy. Mary Carroll's perdition was rejected. This response made it clear that Mary Carroll's crime was not her first offence, thereby confirming her guilt in the eyes of the humble and obedient servant. It could be deduced that since Mary Carroll had four children and a husband that were so dependent on her, she may have stolen in order to provide for them. If this was the case then, her husband Patrick was most likely complicit in her crimes. The judge recognises Patrick Carroll to be a respectable man, whilst failing to see any grounds for clemency towards his wife. Mary Carroll was transported on the Phoebe. She committed just one offence in Van Diemen's land. She was recorded as a, as a servant in the Grange Gorman Register and that she could read and write. She had been convicted twice before and had served six months for stealing money and three months for stealing a cloak. Her husband had maintained she was of weak intellect. However, the fact that she could read and write makes her among the most literate of the women in this research. Only 86 of the seven ships were able to read and write. That's 7.9%. That she had been in jail on two occasions prior to her transportation conviction could infer something else. Her husband had also maintained that she had been made the dupe of artful designing villains. This could indicate that Mary Carroll may well have been part of a criminal gang, although, as her husband had petitioned, they had four children dependent on her. Although no record is made regarding her literacy, she was now recorded as a dry nurse in the conduct register. Mary Carroll received her ticket of leave by July 1848, just three and a half years after arriving. Her only offences 
when the her only offence was the delivery of an illegitimate child in 1846. She gained her certificate of freedom in 1851, continuing the pattern of approximately six years after her arrival. Mary Sullivan prevent, presents an inverted narrative. She arrived on the John William Dare in May 1852. She had been convicted in her native county of Cork in 1850 for stealing clothes. She had been in jail twice before, once for stealing clothes and had served six months, and once for stealing from the union workhouse, also resulting in six months imprisonment. Given her young age, she was 17 when she arrived in the colony, therefore would have been 15 when she was convicted. It is possible to say that she was one of the forsaken, as described by Dinkna McLaughlin. The forsaken is the term used to describe those who were brought to the workhouse as infants or abandoned children and who were raised there. They were effectively institutionalized and were unable to carry out any respectable work. The minute books of these institutions testify that female inmates were perceived as unmovable deadweight. Her mental health has also been called into question. This may go some way to explaining Mary Sullivan's social inabilities in Van Diemen's land. She had no occupation in Grange Gorman, but when she arrived in Van, Van Diemen's land, her conduct register records her as being a nurse girl. Her new occupation would result in complete disaster. In July 1852, she absconded. A reward of two pounds was offered to apprehend her. The reason is clear upon reading her conduct page. She was again tried at the Supreme Criminal Court on the 21st of July 1852 for the willful murder of Adeline Clara Blackburn Fraser on the 7th of this month, a child of two years old, and sentenced to be hanged and dissected. Mary Sullivan was executed on August 5th, 1852. But on a happier note, other women who were transported just before the famine were two sisters, Judith and Margaret Byrne. They were transported for stealing a pair of shoes in Dundalk in 1845. Their family had petitioned on their behalf that they not be transported. They had an ill and feeble father, it was said, who relied on them. They also had a mother, two sisters and two brothers. By 1848, both Byrne sisters were married and by 1851, they were both free. One wonders if their family in Ireland were still alive or whether there was anyone to marry for their two brothers and two sisters after the, after the devastation of the famine years. Other positive narratives include two women in my research who were still alive in 1909 and applied for their old age pension. Mary Ryan was 16 when she was transported from Waterford for seven years for larceny and Margaret Leahy was 17 when she was transported from Cork for 10 years for larceny. 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 To conclude, the petitions and cases, case evidence provide testimony to the existence of the women who were transported from Grange Gorman Transportation Holding Depot and the conduct registers present an official record of the women in the colony. Apart from these records, all their achievements and failures died with them. The Grange Gorman Transportation Register, the convict reference files, and the conduct registers are an, inval an, an invaluable resource for the historian of convictism. My subsample of 1,095 convict women allows for a penetrative analysis of convict studies, Irish women's history, mid 19th century Irish history, and colonial Australian history. The end.